Welcome to session eight of Living is Dying. My name is Sering. I'd like to wish you all a happy Mother's Day. Um, we could de dedicate this session to all our dear mothers, past, present and future. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and other lands and recognise their connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Our session today is titled, Shop Consciously and Make a Will. I will read what Rinpoche has to say. We human beings love our creature comforts and every one of us wants to be happy. It's why we put so much effort into stockpiling money and material goods. Isn't it ironic that everything we do for the sake of comfort and ease ends up being the source of endless stress and heartache? If you own money and property, decide how it should be used once you are dead. Settle your material affairs and make a will. Perhaps you could give your worldly goods and house to your children or nieces or cousins or to a Save the Leopard Foundation, or to cancer research. Try to act more consciously. When you shop, be clear-headed. Stop buying and hoarding useless objects. Don't be a pack rat. And if you want to, pl and if you want to plan and make long-term investments, do it in the full knowledge that you could die before those investments mature. There is another related section in the book that I'd like to include here from Chapter 4, How Buddhists Prepare for Death, titled Distribute Your Worldly Goods. Practically speaking, once you know that your own death is imminent and certain, try to ensure that your property and belongings are put to good use. Offer what you own to sentient beings and towards the propagation of the Dharma. Even things as small as needles and thread. By offering everything to the Dharma, you become fearless. It is also good to make offerings to charities, hospitals, schools and so on. So to assist us regarding the important step of making a will, I have pleasure in introducing, first of all, my beautiful granddaughter, Neela Norbo, a lawyer with a large global law firm in Sydney. Neela has been fortunate to have known Songsa Kenza and Pache since her birth into a Buddhist family. Neela spent lots of time in Bhutan, Taiwan and India whilst growing up learning about the Buddha for as long as she can remember. Neela was the Australia and New Zealand coordinator and head of social media and content of Rinpoche's Bumi Spasha Touching the Earth project when it launched in 2020. Neela has a Bachelor of Laws and a Bachelor of Medical Science. She is an accomplished musician and a keen AFL player. Neela's passion lies in social justice and her strong foundation in the Dharma is what continues to guide her in her life and her work. A welcome, Neela. Thank you. <laughs> Neela, can you explain to us legally why it's so, so important for all of us to make a will and not only when we're at death's door? Um, so it's really important to make a will before you are at death's door um, because it provides the people around you and the people that are important to you um, with clarification and it allows it allows you to get your own say in what happens to your belongings um, after you pass away um, and because we none of us know when per se we're going to pass away um, could be tomorrow could be in 50 years, um, you never know. So it's always good to make a will sooner rather than later. And when do we consider appointing a legal power of attorney? And what does that involve? So a power of attorney often 
um, there's a general power of attorney and there's an enduring power of attorney. So an enduring power of attorney is someone you can appoint to manage your financial and legal decisions on your behalf, um, but they can only do that while you're alive. And so the idea surrounding enduring power of attorney um, is that even after you lose the ability to make decisions for yourself, whether that's because you've suffered from some sort of temporary or permanent loss of capacity, that's when your enduring power of attorney comes in. Hmm. And I've heard that this is no longer valid after the person is deceased. So who takes care of the financial obligations then? So that's correct, yes. Yeah. So um, after you've passed the your general power of attorney, your enduring power of attorney, um, they both don't have any powers anymore because you've passed. So your powers then aren't alive as you aren't alive. Um, and so once that's happened, um, your financial and legal obligations are dealt by what's called an executor. So an executor is the person, or it could be an organization um, responsible of managing your assets and carrying out the directions that you make in your will, which is why it's also important to uh, draft a will because with that, you'll have an executor. Hmm. And are there any pitfalls to avoid when making a will and appointing a legal power of attorney? Um, so when you're writing your will um, and trying to pick an executor, it's important to think about uh, the different responsibilities that come with being an executor. So the executor is the first person who sort of gets the ball rolling after you've passed and they have to deal with lots of everyday things such as like if you have pets or something, they have to deal with who looks after your pets and redirect your mail and organise like your death certificate and things like that. So that's at the start, it's they're really, really crucial before they then start to divide your assets and things like that. Um, on the other hand, a power of attorney. Um, so because that person deals with your um, uh, financial and legal decisions while you're alive, um, but you have like a loss of capacity, um, it's also then important to think about the responsibilities that come with that as well. So then you can weigh up who you might think has the skills to fulfill that role. And with uh, making a will, uh, sometimes we can purchase will kits in uh, the post office or, mm. or so forth. Well, would you recommend that um, we um, seek legal advice when we're making a will? Yeah, so um, <laughs> as a lawyer, I'm definitely... Um, <laughs> I have, I have to say that you should definitely go through a solicitor or a lawyer um, to uh, draft your will. But the will kits that come in the post office are actually quite good so far as they give you a basic draft. So then you can take that draft to a lawyer and say, this is what I've got so far. What do you think? Do you think there's anything I should add? Is there anything I might be missing? And the lawyer will be able to sort of fill in the gaps for you. Um, hmm. and make sure that when you're signing things, witnessing things, your executor is being appointed, all of that has gone through the right steps so that when you pass away, your will is valid. Because if it's invalid, then they call, it causes a lot of other issues that they yes. want to deal with, yeah. Yes, I could imagine. Um, yeah. And um, it's probably good to uh, discuss with someone that you might choose to be your executor um, before you nominate them. Yeah. Yeah. Similar, similar to um, uh, when you appoint uh, like people to be guardians of your children, if you pass, you, you want to discuss it with someone to, so they understand the responsibility that they take on as being your executor. And if they don't feel like um, they are uh, ready is probably not the right word, but if they don't feel like they could <laughs> fulfill um, that role when the time comes, then that's important. It's important for them to be involved in that decision as well um, yeah. for everyone's benefit. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, we may wish to consider bequeathing to a charity in our will. And as a Buddhist practitioner, 
we may like to consider how we can make offering towards the propagation of the Dharma, as Rinpoche mentioned in that uh, last part of the book that I just read. Uh, for example, bequeathing to a, a Buddhist organization or, or a body like 84,000 or Kenzie Foundation. Are there special considerations when bequeathing property to charity in lieu of families? And is it good to discuss this beforehand with family members so they have some understanding of our choice? Yeah, so um, I think bequeathing property to charity is really fantastic. Um, it's a way to give back to the things that you loved um, in your lifetime. And especially as a Buddhist, it's a fantastic way to continue mm. the Dharma. With, um, yeah, with yeah. Um, generating generosity. Yeah, exactly. Um, but there are a couple of considerations um, when you're bequeathing property to charity. So first would be um, how you divvy up your property for charity. So there are four main ways that you can do that. Um, you mm -hmm. either give a residual um, amount, which is whatever's left over after everything else in your will has been distributed. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you could do a percentage of your estate because most of us don't know how much money we'll have when we die. So you could give it in a percentage number, um, otherwise like a sp specific sum of money, or you can give a gift of property or shares. So if you, for example, if you had a statue, um, you could uh, list that as a gift. Um, but before you gift anything to charity, it's important to have your debts settled first. So um, you don't want to be going and giving um, <laughs> gifts to charity and then after the fact realising that, you know, you've got this massive debt that you've just forgotten about and then it causes some issues. Um, so that's really important. And also checking that the charity you're um, wanting to bequeath something to is a registered charity. And I think when you're drafting a will, it's important to maybe give the charity a call and see if they have any preferences and how that and how you bequeath it in your will, because um, that can help in the process just to make things a little bit easier. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in relation to talking to your loved ones, it is really important because sometimes people can um, it can be a bit of a, like cause for contention. Um, so it's important to chat to your loved ones about, um, I guess, why you're gifting to that charity and why it's important to you. But ultimately putting it in your will and mm -hmm. letting your executor know that that's part of your wishes, which is why it's in your will, um, is the best way. Because mm. I guess if, um, if the family isn't aware of it and um, may not agree, then... Um, it's probably quite possible for them to contest the will. Yeah, so um, contesting, there is a, there's a clause within uh, most uh, succession provisions throughout Australia, and I imagine overseas as well, um, that says within 12 months of someone's death, if a category of persons, which is mostly family, believe that they weren't properly provided for by a will, then they can contest the will. So this mm. is called the family provision claim. And so that's why it's important to get your will um, finalised through a solicitor and let your family know what your thoughts are and things like that. Um, because, yes. yeah, con a contested will is never is never, never good. <laughs> Nothing good ever comes <laughs> out of having a contested <laughs> will. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, Neela. Um, I'm sure um, our uh, participants will have some questions and uh, Neela will be available to answer questions at the end of the session if you uh, would like to put your questions in the chat box. That would be good. And uh, now we... I'd like to ask uh, Julie St. Auburn, a member of our Living as Dying presentation team, to join us in this discussion. 
Uh, Julie is an artist whose interest in the human spirit and intrigue of death led her into working in the field of palliative care, initially with coordinating the Caring Circle, a community-based support service here in our country town of Kyogle in the Northern Rivers District of New South Wales, where she also raised her four children, taught art in local schools, exhibited her artwork and volunteered regularly at Rinpoche's retreat, Vajradara Gompa, including being the medical support for the two residential three-year retreats there. After moving to the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Julie trained and then worked as a funeral director. Julie's creative journey through life has been influenced by the themes of impermanence and death and enhanced by the Buddhist teachings and her own Buddhist practice. Julie, it seems like, um, well, first of all, welcome. <laughs> this is the first time we've had you on Living is Dying, <laughs> even though you've uh, been part of the team working towards the presentation of the um, sessions that we've been uh, presenting. Uh, so it seems like it's not only our property and assets that we need to think about when making a will. Uh, Rinpoche even mentions needles and threads. <laughs> and um, can you explain to us about ethical wills? Well, historically, ethical wills began as a way of passing down our values and beliefs. So it was probably more seen in the realm of religion. In the modern day, we've really gone quite a long way from that. Um, it tends to be something that we write down and leave sometimes with our will and sometimes with appointed people um, to give an idea of what was of value to us in our lifetime. So our beliefs, values, mm -hmm. conclusions that we might have reached about being alive in this world. Um, not everyone can publish a book. Right. If we did, we'd have it all there for people to to read, but we might like to write down some tips about lessons that we've learnt. Um, we might want to have a final say in things that we know we won't be around to uh, be part of, uh, projects, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people keep diaries and journals and we might want to pass them on to people after we die. We might equally like to have someone appointed to either dispose of or distribute those, the written or visual diaries that we leave behind. It might mm. be important for us to think about that now rather than have someone find a box of your thoughts and feelings in an attic somewhere someday. Um, also writing on the back of old photos and completing all sorts of family history would be a really lovely thing to do either uh, by yourself or with, with other family and friends as, as a finalising of um, your life. Um, you may want to leave something in the form of a letter. You might want that to be distributed or sent out even by post after you've died. It's a nice little touch base even when you're no longer here. Some people actually make a film that speaks to you from beyond the grave so that you can actually turn up again with something more that you want to share. Uh, there is a bit of a current trend of people that are called uh, funeral crashes and they tend to be employed by the then deceased to have a final say on their behalf. And from what I can understand, it's not necessarily in, always in a positive way. So um, it might be an opportunity, I guess, for people to disclose or air something that they didn't feel that they could uh, share during their lifetime. So mm -hmm. it's another opportunity. Um, it is your chance to have your final say. Um, and I dug out one that I had written 20 years ago, and I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea of what form that might take. It's basically just an A4 piece of paper in my case. And I decided after looking it over that I probably would only add a, a really good book list 
of books that I read in my life that really influenced me. That's probably all I found that was missing. But just as, as a little bit of a tip, I had a list of the best advice received and from my grandmother, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. From my father, sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. And from my mother, if you only have lemons, make lemonade. And for me, I knew those things. They'd been said to me many times, but it was really nice, the idea that I could then hand that down to the next generation. Uh, from myself, I said, be yourself. Make time for doing nothing at all. Whatever you do in life, try to have no regrets. And helping others is the key to happiness. Avoid aggression, barbed wire, credit cards, cheap wine, going without a hat, saying yes too much or no, not enough. Enjoy the love of animals, the company of good friends. Time out, good books, movies, a ripping yarn, nature, experiences, traveling, and staying at home. Do the best you can with what you've got, strive for more, settle for less. When all seems bleak, it probably is. But remember who your friends are, birthdays, to put the cat out, to pay your bills, only make short-term plans and pick the fruit at the best time. Most of all, that I love you. <laughs> so that's just a guide to what, it, to what worked for me. I didn't really feel that I wanted to burden anyone with too much control after death. So for me, it was a bit lighthearted, but whatever form your ethical will may take, now's as good a time as any to to think about what form it is for you. Hmm. And uh, I know myself, uh, something that's often passed down, uh, especially from mothers to daughters, is um, recipe books. And I still use um, my late mother's recipe books and really value those. Yes. And... Um, yeah, the value, like you said, of um, making sure that photographs are noted um, so that um, uh, future generations can look back and see, yeah, when, what was happening when and so forth. Who was who? And as I wrote that, I realised that maybe in the modern day with technology, there might not be mm. two actual photographs in hand mm. right on the mm. off, but you know some of us still have them and I feel it's a really important bit of family history to try and preserve so. mm. and others of us had have um, electronic <laughs> hundreds of photographs uh, that perhaps could be um, yeah noted as well at least sorted into groups and yeah, made easier to uh, pass on, which uh, brings me to another um, um, thought is, uh, particularly in the case of Buddhist practitioners, we seem to gather practice materials during our journey and uh, we probably need to nominate someone to distribute our Buddhist books and statues and images uh, to Sangha members after we've gone and make a list uh, of who some of those items would go to. And uh, I don't know if um, that would be something, uh, perhaps I can ask Neela if that would be something that we would include in our will. Yeah, so um, that's definitely something you would include in your will. Um, with statues and things like that um, it's really easy to include um, and you can almost nominate so you can have multiple executors of your will um, and you can nominate a person uh, to be the executor of your dharma belongings and as long as you define dharma belongings in your will then mm -hmm. that person will be able to distribute um, your dharma belongings um, in relation to electronic dharma belongings, um, uh, they can be 
if, if they're allowed to be distributed, they can be distributed similar to your um, sort of physical items. Um, but if for things like restricted texts and things like that, the executor that's in charge of your Dharma belongings, if you would like them to be deleted, then they can do that and so on and so forth. Hmm. Yes, it's probably good to have something uh, in place where you, um, you know, um, make uh, provision for, um, you know, hard drives to be uh, deleted and so forth where there is uh, personal or restricted uh, material. Yeah. And passwords would be a very important thing to, to mm. pass Mm. Mm. Yes, there's many things to consider in this um, electronic age where, <laughs> yeah, we need to be able to access, um, yeah, the deceased information. And um, are there any particular sort of rules or laws around that, Neela? Or um, the executor would have that. Um, yeah. So generally, the executor would have that information, mm -hmm. um, but if they didn't, they're usually they're able to get things like passwords and stuff like that um, from the organisation that they're trying to like get into. Like, if it's like a, mm -hmm. for example, if it's if you've got like a mailing subscription for something, and to cancel the subscription, you need to have a password to get in. You can get around things like that by saying this person has passed away. I'm the executor of the estate. Can you just cancel X, Y, Z services? Um, for things like laptop passwords, um, there's no laws surrounding it because generally um, mm. laws are a little bit behind the times. <laughs> um, mm. But norm normally most people do find a way to crack through whether that's through like IT services assisting or things like that but there are no specific laws um, more just that your executor is not going to get charged with offences relating to privacy and things like that if they're cracking into your laptop and stuff like that yeah hmm. yeah we've um been using um, a little book called the bottom drawer book if you can see this yeah <laughs> um, this is um, something that um, sort of includes um, everything that um, we've been speaking about um, with um, making a um, advanced care directive with um, living wills and with ethical wills and um, and where to keep your will and we will be speaking in a future session about funerals and in this little book there's all sorts of places to make notations about um, uh, and messages to your um, to your loved ones and uh, I would really um, recommend this um, you can um, uh, yeah leave all sorts of little drawings and poems and and uh, writings and it's all in one little book that you can have um, in a place where you can tell your loved ones where they can find it and uh, it's there ready for whenever you might die whenever that might be so um, the other um, point that Rinpoche was making was about um, being a pack rat and many of us have experienced the work involved in clearing out a loved one's home after they've passed away, especially the older generation, uh, like my parents' era, or even myself, who might have lived through difficult times, and they would often keep all sorts of things just in case they might be needed in the future. 
and I'm sure there's those of us who are hoarders in every generation. But this accumulation of things causes headaches and heartaches, not only for those that are left responsible to dispose of our possessions after our death, but also in the case of moving house or losing one's possessions, as in floods and bushfires, and so please, um, before you invest in that extra creature comfort, as Rinpoche calls them, think of those who may be left to clear it all after you've gone and uh, really take um, note of Rinpoche's warning there. <clears throat> so we could now take some uh, questions um, if there are questions in the chat box. Would you like to? So I've just asked Ross to read the um, questions. So we have a question from Sarah Rinson. Hello. No, sorry. Should read the question before I say anything. <laughs> From Joseph Nemo, our sister told our birth mother her wishes as to her st how her stuff was to be divided, but because she didn't get her own way, she gave everything to whoever she wanted to out of spite instead. So, mm -hmm. any, um, so, and the comment is written is important, so you we, we've discussed that. You would like to add anything to that? Like the situation that arises from uh, wills that are not clear, things like that. Yeah, so I guess that's um, <clears throat> part of the reason why it's so important um, for everything to be written down um, and everything to be sort of cross-checked with a solicitor just to make sure that you are going to get everything that you'd like to after you've passed. And uh, Julie, what's your experience with... Um wills, uh, complicated wills or things that are not written down and the disputes that can arise. You're, you're muted, Julie. There may always be in families people who feel that they didn't get as good a deal as someone else, but at the end of the day I feel that it's not your will, it's the will of the deceased person, so I'd like to believe that we can, um, that'll be the sort of bottom line. Um, and it certainly is legally, as far as I'm aware. Um, I have been involved in a contested will. It is greatly distressing. And like Neela said, I think nothing really good comes out of that. Um, I like to believe that the person who left the will was clear enough about their wishes to make a will and to try and be fair so I'd like to believe that we could follow them as they are but there will always be people who feel that they've missed out so I guess the law leaves that family clause there for 12 months for those people to have a say. Um, I'm not sure what happens after the 12 months, Neela? Um, I think after the 12 months you're um, the time, there's like a limitation period, so you can't contest after 12 months unless new information comes to light about whether the will was made under duress or wasn't signed properly. There might be another will that existed after it. Um, so the ability to contest becomes a lot smaller as opposed to in the first 12 months you can cont contest because you feel like you didn't get, you weren't properly provided for. Yeah. I have some families where the person has written on the back of all their possessions 
to make absolutely sure that each painting book, cup, saucer, needle and pin went to the person that they hoped would, would receive it. But then <laughs> people did go along and change the tags. So <laughs> only so much control you can have. And once you have died, really, I guess you're not going to worry anymore. It's, that's, that's left to those who are living to work it out. Okay, another question from Sophia Sharma. Neela, I'd like to know what happens if the organisation that will receive our endowment is located overseas? For example, if an Australian citizen wishes to have a Buddhist monastery or nunnery in India receive their life savings after death, how do we set this up? Um, so your will, um, you can put it in your will and let your executor know. Um, and generally I would sort of follow the same thinking as if you're, if you were, um, leaving something to someone in Australia. So I would try and contact the monastery or the nunnery and ask generally their link to like a foundation, for example, most of the monastery, like most of Kensi Rubish's monasteries are linked somehow, some way potentially to Kensi Foundation. So you would try and contact um, the foundation or the institute and see how that money can be directly dispersed to a specific monastery um, in India or wherever, wherever that may be. Um, I think going through the monastery or the nunnery is probably the most direct way to make sure that how you're writing it in your will is and how your executor goes about distributing that is a way that the monastery or nunnery can accept it, that donation. Okay, and another question for Neela My, from uh, Yan. My mum is a permanent resident in Australia. Will the will she make in Australia apply to her assets overseas? Um, so it really depends on what overseas countries um, she has other assets in. So if it's a Commonwealth country, so like UK, New Zealand, Canada, any of the other Commonwealth countries, um, then generally the law they have the laws that apply in those countries are very similar to the laws that apply here in relation to wills and succession and things like that. So generally they will recognise, those countries recognise Australian wills and then it'll apply to your overseas assets. But if it's for a country that's not part of the Commonwealth, then you'll have to look at the laws in that specific country and you'll probably have to speak to a solicitor in that specific country to make sure that you're abiding by their laws. Um, and then you would draft your Australian will for your Australian assets and your other will, like your foreign will, um, for the assets held in that country. Um, and they're called concurrent wills. And you just have to make sure that with both of them, they don't cancel each other out. Um, yeah. So I would definitely recommend seeing a solicitor in the country overseas as well. Okay, and uh, another question from Caroline. To add a special request, must I go through a solicitor or can I add a witness dated note to my will? Um, so you can, um, yeah, you can add a witnessed and signed and dated note to your will. Um, that's possible. I just, yeah, probably recommend um, going through a solicitor, but you don't have to. And one question more from Zhangmo. Neela, how often should we review our will? And if we have one and make another, as long as it is, it is lodged with a solicitor, must the recent one, sorry, the most recent one will be the valid one? That's a question, will it be? Mm -hmm. So I'd probably say you should review your will 
I guess it kind of kind of depends. Um, I would probably say you should review your will at least every time you acquire a new large asset so that you can add it to your will. Um, then after, besides that, uh, I get when you add, when new family members are added to your family, probably then as well. Um, but otherwise, if you make one and then you update it, slash so review it, and um, as long as it's witnessed, signed, dated, that'll be the most valid one. And as long as you're, yeah, I think the place that you keep your will is probably is quite important. So generally, people will keep it with their solicitor. Um, but if you don't keep it with your solicitor, then keeping it in a place where your executor knows where it is and knows what that each where each updated copy is um, is also important. And another question from Lilia: Do you recommend appointing successor trustees, executors, in the event that one appointed is? either no longer available to carry out the task or is unwilling. Yeah, so you can uh, always appoint either multiple executives or successor executives. Um, and is it, rec I think generally I'd recommend appointing at least two. Um, that way it's a, bit of, it's a bit of balance, a bit of shared responsibility um, and yeah, it like like we've all said no one knows when they're going to pass and so you don't know what is happening in your executor's life as well when you pass and whether they're able to fulfill their responsibilities as an executor having another person that might also be able to assist or be able to fulfill those duties is important for your estate. And Patricia, Patricia makes a comment here I can see that discussing your choices is very important before you die, so <laughs> others also understand and feel considered by your effort to talk about it. Yeah, and, definitely. Yeah. And a question from Zhang Mo. What happens when someone does not have a will when they die? Um, so in Australia, there are the laws that govern wills and things like that um, is under the Succession Act and I think it's it's across all the different states um, and so when you die a thing called intest intestacy rules come into play um, and so there's a there's an order of relatives so generally it'll everything will go to your spouse if you don't have a spouse then it'll go to your kids and then there's like a list of other relatives that it can go to. Like if you don't have kids, then it goes to the next person. Just keep going down. Um, and if that, if you die without a will and without eligible relatives, then your estate will pass to the crown or the state. Yeah. And another question from Lilia. There is a clause in my will which states the will cannot be contested. Does this exist in Australia? Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I know that if there is a clause in your will that says it can't be contested, there are still, uh, I think it's four main reasons to contest a will which involve the uh, how the will was drafted. So whether... Um, your will was drafted under duress, so you were forced to do it, or it's not the most recent one, or there are two other reasons, but it's escaping my mind at the moment. Um, but I think if you have that clause, then often the family provisions claim doesn't apply, but I'm not 110% sure. I'm so sorry. And a question from... Kamala, if you don't have an obvious family member to appoint as an executive or would possibly not be experienced to deal with financial affairs, your, your, your family members all live a long way away or are older, 
and likely to pass first, what options are available to you regarding appointing an executor? Yep, so um, every state has in Australia has something called uh, the trustee and guardian. So I am a solicitor in New South Wales, so we have the New South Wales trustee and guardian. Um, and the trustee and guardian is the body that's responsible for um, being the executor if they're, for example, if you're the executor that you've appointed has passed away, for example, um, then the trustee and guardian can do that role. Um, and that's sort of the same, the same things sort of apply if you don't have um, a will. I think as well, um, if you're, if you have a will and but you don't, I don't know that you can draft a valid will without an executor at all. So I think the state would have to be your executor in that case or your solicitor. But if your solicitor is your executor, it can be very expensive, very, very quickly because being an executor is actually quite time consuming um, and the lawyer will charge you every minute that they do the work. Um, so it gets super expensive, super quickly and definitely wouldn't recommend it. Um, yeah. And a question from Bell. It feels like such a huge thing to ask someone to be either power of attorney or executor. Is there a reasonably priced government body we can rely on instead? Some people don't even have family, i.e. me, and some don't have close enough friends. Um, yeah, so that would be the New South Wales trustee and guardian. I'm not exactly sure what their, like their pricing structure around being an executor is, but I there's this thing called an executor's commission, and that applies when it's a government body um, who is your executor. I'm not 100% sure what that commission amount is, but it's definitely um, something to look at. But yeah, the state, the state will be your executor if you don't have anyone else. And Bell also asked, also, can you briefly explain again what a power of attorney does? Um, so the power of attorney is responsible for all your financial and legal decisions while you're alive. Um, if you become temporarily or permanently um, incapacitate. And this is, you've covered this a little bit, but also ask what happens if you don't have a will or power of attorney or executor? Um, so if you don't have any of those things, the state will be the one who makes the decisions or um, gives, uh, distributes your assets. Um, although that being said, like I said before, it'll go through, um, if you do have a will, then your assets will go through your order of relatives. And if you don't have a, like, if you don't have a power of attorney, for example, um, so like oh, sometimes a lot of people don't have a power of attorney, um, especially when they're young. So for example, I don't have a power of attorney. Um, you're often your next of kin can make those um, financial and legal decisions. Okay, and the following question is from Mark, and we've just answered that, I hope. Um, and one from Zongmo. Ju uh, Julie, thanks for sharing your ethical will, such a lovely way to share things. Is this becoming a more popular practice? I'd like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> you can only encourage it. It just seems like a nice touch. Having worked a lot with families at a particularly difficult time of the death of the loved one, it's just a really nice thing. It sort of breaks the tension, puts a smile on your face, and I think there's not enough of that. Mm. And uh, Neela, I... I think I've heard of instances where 
uh, you can ask your lawyer to be your executor. Is that the case? Yeah, so you definitely can. It's just can be a really expensive exercise. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> generally lawyers are pretty expensive um, and mm. being an executor is a super time-consuming job. Um, there are just so many little things that continue to pop up and every time the lawyer deals with it, the lawyer's going to mm-hmm. charge the state or, mm. yeah, so... Um, it, you, it can happen if, if that's what you want, um, but it's really important to consider how much it's going to cost your estate. Mm-hmm. There's just one more question in the chat about where to get the bottom drawer book, Saring. Right. <laughs> we, um, uh, we have it in uh, resources um, and you can go to our website, the um, SIA Living is Dying website and the um, uh, details of the book and where to purchase the book, where to send to get the book is uh, there in the on the website. If we don't have any more questions, I might just uh, go on to the next section in the book on uh, page 28 of the PDF. Where Rinpoche talks about family ties. For many of us, family relationships cause the most problems, especially as we approach death. In places like China, the family continues to be a very powerful social unit. To this day, traditional ideas about family roles perpetuate rigid and often repressive culture on social expectations. Fathers must always fulfill the obligations that Chinese fathers have always fulfilled and children must live as Chinese children have always lived to please their parents. But how beneficial are these family entanglements? Parents are expected to provide for their children no matter what it takes, but is obsessive parental devotion what children really need? Does it do them any good? Having dedicated at least two decades to bringing up their children, many Chinese parents then have to deal with yet another level of family entanglement when grandchildren start appearing. Shouldn't there be some kind of sell-by date on all consuming family involvements? Chinese children are under just as much pressure to live up to social expectations as their parents including taking responsibility for their parents as they get older. But actually, anyone who aspires to be a decent human should willingly do all they can to care for their parents, family and friends. Of course, there is no reason not to enjoy family life, but in terms of preparing for death, try to participate consciously. Always remember that sooner or later you will die And in that light, try to watch yourself as you navigate family life. If that watcher is always conscious of how you behave, think and act, your family obligations and attachments will be less limiting. Whatever you do, always remember that death, which is unpredictable but certain, is just around the corner and that when you die, you die alone. So try to use the watcher to help you avoid getting bogged down in too many knotty emotional family complications. So Rinpoche seems to be mentioning um, uh, Chinese families here, but I'm sure there are plenty of um, circumstances and examples we could find in every culture and uh, We've just been hearing about the kinds of things that we need to consider, you know, 
as we prepare for death and beyond um, in um, making our will and and not um, being a pack rat and uh, just uh, being aware of how we live our life. And perhaps we can just for a few moments sit and uh, absorb and if uh, there are any more questions that come up uh, while we um, sit, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat box. We'll just sit for a few moments. So thank you so much, Neela and Julie. Um, these are uh, sometimes difficult topics to even to think about um, uh, when uh, Annie Zangmo and uh, Ross and I were entering a three-year retreat. We had to make our advance care plans and our wills and our enduring power of attorneys. And it was quite um, it was quite challenging to um, yeah to have to do that, and uh, but well worth doing, and certainly um, good preparation for progress on on our path with our practice. We will now dedicate the merit from this uh, discussion. This virtuous accumulation of merit we offer so that all obstacles dissolve and at the time of our death each of us may find ease in dying and swift rebirth in the pure land of great bliss, quickly gaining enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Now next week, uh, Junchip and Jacob will be presenting the section on taking refuge and to participate in the simple Buddhist refuge ceremony, you may like to have on hand an image of the Buddha and a flower to offer during the ceremony. And you're also welcome to just be an observer. So thank you and we'll see you next week.
Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neela. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Julie and Neela. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thank you. Mother's Day. Thanks, Sarah. Happy, Happy, Happy Mother's Day. Day. <laughs> Happy Buddha Happy. Jayanti, too. Happy Mother's yes. Day. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> mother's Day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> oh, no.